Welcome to the uh, campus of the National Hispanic Cultural Center. And I would like to welcome you all to uh, one of our programs in the La Canoa Legacy Talk that is a collaboration between the National Hispanic Cultural Center and the Center for Regional Studies. The Center for Regional Studies is dedicated to the creation of knowledge about New Mexico, the greater Southwest as a region, its connections to Northern Mexico, Latin America, and Spain. The uh, La Canoa Legacy Talks take their inspiration from the very word, La Canoa, which can have several meanings. Here, at the campus of the uh, National Hispanic Cultural Center, we have a more modern rendition, an artistic rendition of La Canoa, which you can see to my right. The uh, piece here reminds us, La Agua es Vida. We also want our talks to create knowledge, inspire action, bring practical and useful information to community members, specialized researchers, and others interested in the history, culture, sociology, politics, and religious experience of our region. Michael is going to introduce Gabriel, but I just wanted to um, thank our HLA staff and volunteers and our crew who helped us keep this beautiful library, just a, a wonderful venue. Um, on your seat uh, is some, uh, some handouts about programming that we have. We're launching a range of new programming, so that's in the folded booklet. And uh, you need to be loud. I can talk really loud. I need to. Um, and uh, the next thing that's coming up um, on May 1st is a reading by Margarita Engel. Uh, she's a Cuban-American author, young adult author. She's the National Young Person Poet Laureate, and uh, she's uh, going to come and read from a couple of her award-winning young adult novels. So if you uh, have any young people in your life and uh, who like to read, and I think all of us here like to read, please come along. And uh, then there's a poem for your pocket, because this is National Poetry Month. And so April 27th is actually the day when we ask you to put a poem in your pocket, but we've been offering these every day of the month. There's about um, eight different ones, so you don't have the same one most likely than the person next to you. But there's a basket in the hallway that has a bunch of them. And um, so please celebrate National Poetry Month with us that way. And then the last thing is there's uh, a feedback form. If you have an iPhone, you can just scan the QR code. It'll take you right to the <coughs> feedback form, and that takes less than a minute. Or you can fill these out and put them in the basket as you walk out. Because we're launching new programming, your feedback is really important to us so that we can hope to promise you high-quality events here at the center. And so if you can take less than a minute or so to fill out the form either online or uh, right there on paper. If you have an Android phone, I found out this yesterday, you have to download the free QR scanner if you're not familiar with that, which doesn't take long. And then you can do all of our evaluations on your phone. Save this paper, because it's Earth Day tomorrow, is that right? Um, and, uh, but either way, it's fine with us. So I think that's it for me, and so I'm going to have Michael introduce that now. Could you be talking about that light so that it's not giving all of us directly? Oh, yeah. yeah. It is really giving all of us directly. Yeah, so, and well, I'll let the crew take care of that because we are video and, and audio recording that, so that's why. So if we can adjust that. Thank you. Uh, that one was in my eyes, so I had them adjust that, and now it's in your eyes. Thank you. The light's good, everything's good. Yeah? All right. So, uh, first I want to reiterate the welcome already extended by my colleague, uh, Valerie Martinez. As already mentioned, these events are co-sponsored by the National Hispanic Cultural Center and the University of New Mexico Center for Regional Studies. 
uh, many people like she, like Valerie, and both the NACC and CRS, some of them who are right now working on the lights and busy thinking about those things. Many people like them do a great deal to make these events happen each month. So right now I'm just going to ask that we give them a round of applause. So So the Kanoa Legacy Talk Series uh, features both academic and community research that considers both our region and our place in the world. Our friend Jose Oliveira defined a Kanoa as a hand-hewn flume cut out of a large log designed to carry the water of the community organized to govern ditches termed acequias across an arroyo. In other words, canoas transport our community's traditional lifeblood and form an organic, integral, and integrating part of our landscapes, both human and natural. Those had hewn flumes, uh, those had hewn collectively constructed objects, are the guiding metaphor for this speaker series. Like a canoa, these talks serve our communities. We hope to provoke dialogue about the things important to us. This afternoon, I am delighted to introduce Gabriel Melendez. He really needs no introduction to all of, to, as you all know him well. He is deeply involved uh, in our speaker series, in this one. But I'm going to introduce him anyway, as <laughs> that's my job right now. Gabriel first wrote the concept paper for La Canola and presented it to the NHCC director years ago. Gabrielle is the director of the Center for Regional Studies at the University of New Mexico, and he is a distinguished professor of American Studies. He was the chair of that department when I was hired there 11 years ago. Moreover, the adjective of distinguished and distinguished professor is not simply my elaboration to say that he looks good. <laughs> <laughs> Rather, distinguished uh, professor refers to the rank above full professor that very few of us ever obtain. To qualify for promotion to distinguished, one must be deemed a leader in his or her respective field, as attested to by a national and international reputation. Gabrielle is truly a distinguished professor. I recall reading as a graduate student over 20 years ago his book, So All Is Not Lost, The Poetics of Print in Nuevo Mexicano Communities. At the time, I was told to read it by my professors in another state. I'm glad that they told me to read it. That book changed my thinking about Nuevo Mexicanos and Latinas and Latinos more generally as well as the thinking, it changed the thinking of many others about us. Gabriel is a creative writer and a key figure in the National Hispanic Literary Heritage Recovery Project. In closing, I suggest everyone read his most recent books, 2017's The Book of Archives and Other Stories from the Mora Valley. And by the way, if you ask him, he might sing something from it to you. And also read his 2013's Hidden Chicano Cinema, Film Dramas in the Borderlands. Today's talk will be a lie halfway around the world, the Carl Taylor murder case. Please welcome Gabriel Melendez. So thank you very much. Muy buenas tardes a cada uno de ustedes. Gracias por venir a esta plática. So this afternoon I'm going to do a fair amount of reading from... Uh, the chapter by the same title, A Lie Halfway Around the World. Um, sub, I subtitled it today, The Carl Taylor Murder Case, a chapter in this book. So uh, bear with me. I'm going to try and hit the high. This is a very dense chapter. Includes a lot of information on this particular case. And it alludes to um, films that came before The Lash of the Penitentes and films that would follow. Matraca, right? Matraca. So matracas are used um, during Lent because bells are not to be rung. Um, anyway, so let me read, uh, moving forward with uh, this chapter. So <clears throat> this section is called Carl Taylor, 
adventure hunter martyr. For the better part of three years, Carl Taylor had been living a less than harrowing life among Nuevo Mexicanos in the Sandia Mountain community of Cedar Crest, some 30 miles away from Albuquerque. Taylor came to New Mexico from Milltown, Indiana in 1926 to pursue a master's degree in English at the University of New Mexico. He completed his studies in 1928 and took a position as an assistant professor at the University of the Philippines in Manila, where he taught for about a year before turning his attention full time to his writings about out of the way places. He returned to the United States in 1930 and spent two unprofitable years writing before returning to the Philippines to gather additional materials for his book, Odyssey of the Islands. Taylor took up permanent residence in New Mexico in 1933, electing to live in Cedar Crest, an early Hispanic settlement that until recent times bore the traditional name San Antonito. <laughs> Did you see the uh, Taylor with the, uh, on the javelina hunt? I hope you got a chance to see that. And this is Taylor emerging from the, uh, the bush in the Philippines. Taylor's friends and acquaintances stirred further speculation in the press immediately following the murder or his murder, the New York Haven Evening Register connected the dots. Taylor's friends said he had a, a penchant for penetrating primitive places for the subject of his writings. Dr. George St. Clair, head of the University of New Mexico's English department, told reporters that Taylor had discussed an article on the tribes of the interior of the Philippines. After that is published, I can never go back to the Philippines, he said. Taylor told him, with regard to this theory, an Albuquerque Journal article noted, quote, the manuscript has been sent to the publishers and the idea that some person who feels whose feet had been stepped on in the Philippines article had seen it and determined to kill the author with regard, with regard as, regarding it as fantastic. While retribution from the distant Orient was considered implausible, the same skepticism did not hold for the penitente. The image of the traveler explorer risking life and limb among the barbarians completely shrouded Taylor. It was, after all, an image located at the center of the master narrative of the traveling anthropologist as cultural authority. And in 1936, it had the power to sway public opinion. It was especially potent when buoyed up, as it often was, by intensifying the elements of mystery, death, and drugs. This then was the story the print media chose to present to the national reading public. The example it held out of lurid spectacle and horror was highlighted by the fact that this story was happening in free America. Most recently, cultural critic Curtis Mares has lucidly shown how New Mexico in the 1930s faced a cross current of social conundrums, each having the potential to drastically determine the future of the region, largely a consequence of the work of the artist colonies in Santa Fe and Taos, tourists had come to be seen as the foundation of the state's future economic well-being. Away from the tourist centers of Taos and Santa Fe, the state was experiencing ec economic distress and chronic poverty, sharpened by labor strife that was in turn exacer exacerbated by the Depression. The picture in rural New Mexico and other parts of the borderlands was one of labor strikes, red baiting, state repression of labor activity, and aggressive drug enforcement. Hispanic and Indian New Mexico was poverty riddled, hungry and destitute. And in an effort to keep the state safe for tourists, government and cultural leadership lumped their fears together and cult called for an all out war on dope fiends, Bolsheviks, labor agitators, and immigrants. In this climate, all foreign others, and in the Southwest, this could, be a, could easily mean Mexican or New Mexican-born brown people could be turned into 
the criminal other. Carl Taylor had recently completed the monograph Agony in New Mexico. A copy was found neatly stacked and undisturbed on the table of the mountain cabin the night he was murdered. Agony would eventually be published in July 1936 in Today magazine, a move that allowed the publisher to cash in on the publicity surrounding the, the murdered writer. Like other tracks of popular journalism dealing with the penitentes, Taylor indulges in some degree of sensationalism about the Brotherhood. But the Today magazine article, if national news outlets were adverse to serving up fear and sensationalism to their readers, Hollywood stu stood ready to exploit those conditions. It is telling that Roland C. Price's other film achievements in 1936, the year that Lash was released, was the B-movie called Marijuana, for which Price did the camera work. Price's Marijuana does not have a New Mexico, a New Mexico connection, but like Lash, it draws heavily on tropes of depravity and moral license. A standard declaimer was required in all exploitation films from the period and was to be found in what industry insiders referred to as the square up script, where filmmakers disavowed any aim to exploit the subject, declaring that to the contrary, their sole mission was to educate by ex exposing a threatening menace in hopes that the public would have stamp it out. The square up was a kind of boilerplate statement into which the particular case for public outcry could be tailored to whatever social menace the exploitation film proposed to examine, be it a sex expose, a narcotic expose, or any number of threats to society. So Carl Taylor has finished this um, piece of writing in, uh, in the Today magazine called uh, Agony in New Mexico. But his writing is somewhat different than uh, the writing of other uh, of the same period. So um, he, he, I go on, Taylor had in fact opted to bring forth a deeper understanding of the religious faith he had witnessed in his penitente neighbors. He had specifically turned his sights toward try, trying to get the question of what their religion really is. In the course of the article, Taylor moves from trepidation to greater appreciation and empathy for the brotherhood. Taylor opened the article by telling of his recent experiences in the Philippines. He begins, on Easter uh, Saturday, three years ago, I stood beside a dusty lane in the Philippine Islands, busily photographing a strange procession. Taylor thinks to himself, I'm glad to be going back to the United States where such, such things can't happen, only to find himself writing about a similar tradition just a few miles outside of Albuquerque. One maintained to his surprise by, quote, the voting citizens of the Republic who, upon recovering from their self-torture, would return to work upon the nearby projects of the New Deal. For Taylor, New Mexico was cause for him to rethink the whole matter of, of his uh, formal education and to consider what had been left out of his school textbooks as he went about discovering how so much of the United States could remain unknown to him. His interrogations at one point became, uh, become self-reflective in a way that is quite unusual in penitente writings from that period. So from reading from that manuscript, he says, my penitente neighbors are honest, simple, and cheerful people. Among them, you will rarely see a dour face. Most of them possess a highly developed sense of community obligation. When someone is ill, a baby is born, or a corpse is to be laid away, there is no lack of neighborly assistance. When hunger stalks through the barren hills, everyone tightens his belt that all may have a little to eat. The boy who chops wood for me and who I think secretly cherishes an ambition someday to be elected the village Cristo is immensely proud of his shiny new bicycle. Some of these people amuse themselves with radios, drive automobiles, get up by alarm clock, use lipstick and hair tonic, and take considerable pride in their mastery of current slang. This section is called Modesto Modestito. And it quotes from a corrido he was writing. If you want to know my name, 
just ask the jailer. News reports provide this picture of Modesto awaiting arraignment after being detained. Meanwhile, young Trujillo sits unconcerned, composing verses of a song in his jail cell. The verses are being written to a folk tune he has picked up, picked up from a friend before the murder. The one verse he shows officers when translated into English without the rhyme says, if you want to know who I am, just ask the jailer. I am Modesto Trujillo, who has just come from San Antonio. Si quieren saber quién soy, pregúntenle al carcelero. Yo soy Modesto Trujillo, que viene de San Antonio, or San Antonito. Not to be confused with San Antonio. Like his counterparts in the artist-writer uh, community of Santa Fe and Taos, Taylor found it beneficial to hire the neighbor boy, Maria Trujillo's son, to do chores for him around the mountain cabin. Modesto spent most of his time chopping wood to heat the cabin and warm water for Taylor's weekly baths. Modesto was likely not a menace to his neighbors, but he did have a penchant for taking things that did not belong to him. Mrs. Ruth Finley, a school teacher at Gallup and one of the few females who kept company with Taylor, had misgivings about the boy. When reporters asked, she remembered sharing her appreh apprehensions with Taylor on a visit to Albuquerque to take in the movie Tobacco Road. She says, isn't it strange? I warned Carl about that boy long ago. I said, I didn't trust Trujillo. And I said, I hoped he would let him go. But Carl only laughed and said, oh, he's stolen things from me once in a while, but I think I have him in hand now. I'm not afraid of him. The mountain boy was a topic of conversation among Taylor's university friends for a good time after the, the murder. Thomas Pierce, an English professor at the university, knew something of Taylor's habits and sat down after the writer's death to pen some of his observations in his journal. He began by describing how the news of Taylor's death reached his friends gathered at Carlisle Gym on the University of New Mexico campus as the art league's satiric ball was in full swing. The revelry is suddenly hushed as the news of Taylor's death filters among the par partygoers. As Pierce has it, George St. Clair's party is gathered in a box on the balcony of Carlisle Gym watching the spectacle below. The gymnasium is, is filled with milling crowds, donning paper hats and blowing whistles and horns. One of the evening's pageants, a satire on Russia for which the local poet Witter Binner had just recited his clever poem, Stalin, Stalin, all the while, is coming to a close. A group of men and women in tunics and caps stage us to dance and are joined by a machine-like figure that pirouettes and parades around an allegorical mock-up of the, quote, five-year plan. Before a masked dancer portraying Stalin, and then suddenly a visibly agitated Carl Redden runs through the gym and rushes up to the box to speak to St. Clair, but the noise of the revelers makes it impossible to hear what, is, what he is saying. Seconds later, St. Clair turns to Pierce, quote, Carl Taylor has been murdered at his cabin in the mountains. The sheriff has just confirmed the report. Unbelieving, I could only repeat, astonished, murdered, and Saint again said, murdered, he's been murdered. Pierce continues, now seven days after the facts are known, after speculation has run the gamut from motives of revenge by the penitentes to more personal complications, the truth is stranger than all else. But perhaps because Pierce could not possibly know the most intricate details of the truth, he reflects on the tremendous irony in the fact that Taylor, the globe-trotting right travel writer who has faced headhunters, wild tribesmen, hobos in slums, and gangs of thugs on waterfronts should be killed while sitting and reading a newspaper in front of his fireplace by a Mexican houseboy whom he trusted to prepare his bath and warm his cabin. As he waited in jail, Modesto had let himself be photographed by news agencies and photos of him circulated in the local and national press, each shot presenting him in a different guise. A Paramount News cameraman was sent from Los Angeles to take talking pictures of the boy and of his jailer, Sheriff Ras Salazar. 
And DA Marby ordered that the footage be destroyed when according to a news report, Sheriff Salazar balked at some questions the cameraman was to ask. The papers reported that the Paramount cameraman would still be permitted to film the crime scene and the boy with the proviso that the filming would not compromise the investigation by discussing the details of the case. Had the movie film not been exposed, we might have even heard Modesto singing his corrido. Fortunately, so several of the still photos taken of Modesto were published and survive. In one, Modesto is standing with Sheriff Ross Salazar before a jail cell, looking every bit the part of the outlaw Billy the Kid. In another photo, Modesto is holding a cigarette to his mouth, Pachuco style, looking every part of the incorrigible Chicano dope fiend. In a couple more, Modesto is seated across from his interrogators, visibly frightened and appearing as though he had just come to understand the enormity of what had happened. In the days before his sentencing, the papers reported that Modesto appeared unmoved and unrepentant as he worked on a beaded belt and, quote, ate and slept well and was apparently unworried. But after being sentenced, he broke down and cried in, the, in his cell. In public, Modesto kept a stoic face, and so too, it seems, did his parents. On February 18th, the Albuquerque jo Journal noted, Quote, the boy who will reach his 16th birth birthday next Saturday did not seem affected while in court chambers. His parents, Mrs. And Mi Mr. and Mrs. Jose Leon Trujillo, were among the spectators and seemed rather st stunned and bewildered, but gave no outward signs of emotion. What more could be expected of a boy in his predicament? As it was, Modesto was displaying an, an amazing range of emotions and thoughts, as photos of him reveal. He was alternately polite, stoic, resigned, filled with bravado, or filled with anguish. In all likelihood, he had felt each of these different emotions as he faced his accusers and an uncertain future. Nowhere is the range of sentiments better represented than on the day Modestito, Surely his mother would have called out to him in this way, was being transferred to the New Mexico State Prison in Santa Fe. Modesto put on a good face for the media, but also let the public in on experiences that were already pointing him toward the life that someone of his ethnicity, class, and religion all too frequently met. met. It's surprising to learn that the, by the time he was 15, Modesto had already tasted the, the hard life of being a migrant worker, something that he found matched his current circumstances as a convict of the state of New Mexico. He's quoted in the paper as saying, this reminds me of the time I hitched hiked and bummed train rides to California. Modesto Trujillo, 15 year old slayer of Carl Taylor, said Tuesday as Sheriff Ross Salazar and two deputies were taking him to state prison in Santa Fe to begin a 99 year sentence. Modesto said, I worked in the tomato fields out there. The boy continued, and it was hard work, and the sun was hot. The boy had a box of candy given him by a friend and offered the officers some, but they declined, thinking that it might be a long time before he had any luxuries. The boy's eyes grew misty at times as he apparently realized he was taking his last automobile ride and enjoying the last look at the Sandias, which were his home since birth for perhaps the remainder of his life, but he did not shed tears as he had when he bade his mother goodbye. The sheriff said the boy was brave about the ordeal of entering the prison where he would spend his 16th birthday next Saturday, February 19th, 1936. Modesto's family did not abandon him. The visitors register for the New Mexico Penitentiary logs the visits of large parties of family members visiting Modesto in July and October of 1936. Three years into his sentence, residents of Cedar Crest and other mountain villages drafted and circulated a petition asking that Modesto be pardoned and allowed to return to his home. The petition dated August 14, 1939, includes the signatures of 138 individuals. That list should include, that the list should include both Anglo and Spanish surnames suggest that local sympathies outweighed the image of Modesto in news reports 
as a fiend and Anglo-hating monster. The petitioners asked Governor John E. Miles to use his office to intervene in the matter, believing that Molesto had been punished enough. Despite the fact that a month later the New Mexico Board of Parole denied a request a request for parole, family members continued to write Governor Miles and subsequent New Mexico governors asking for clemency in the case. Modesto would serve nine years of his original sentence of 99 to 100 before it was commuted in February 1945 to 25 years to 99. Modesto received a, con a conditional release from prison in October 1946 and his sentence was commuted twice more, once in July 1948 and again in August 1949. After serving 16 years, he was finally discharged from, prison, from the prison system in January 1951. This is a letter from a high school student who lived in Old Town, and it's a member of the Jinso family. So this Jinso family were connected to folks in the East Mountains, right? They had, they had uh, relatives on that side of the mountain. She's writing to Governor Miles, and she says, Dear Mr. Miles, to be the first year of me to vote and to make and to really make my folks turn there to your side. Yes, sir, we go for Governor John Miles. He keeps his record straight and I swear that you will give me no good answer for this question. Mr. Miles, why do I read and read in the papers that you, Mr. Miles, are doing so much for the prisoners. I guess I see every prisoner's name in that paper. I read it about 150 times to see if I can see that in that long list, this name, Modesto El Trujillo, everybody says you are doing so much for them. Why, and can't you do something for him? Please, Miles, answer my questions and make them good. So the, the uh, petitioning work went on and included members of family and so forth. And here's a, a, um, a young high school student who obviously, is, her first language is Spanish, right? So she's having difficulty. Uh, and there's a certain informality to the letter as well. So the shallow mysteries, such as the one, one's district attorney, the district attorney Marbury alluded to in the Santa Fe New Mexican, linger. He said, the boy had in his possession a new bicycle and a camera and other articles believed to have been stolen for the reason that the boy had no money with which to purchase these things. If the items mentioned were indeed stolen and if some of the goods belonged to Carl Taylor, then quite naturally this would have damaged the master chore boy relationship and turned it towards its tragic ending. But it is likely that the bike was not stolen since Modesto had no qualms about riding it through the village, giving the impression that he was, quote, immensely proud of his shiny new bicycle. Perhaps Carl Taylor bought him things or let, lent him things, just as he had let him dress up preppy style and pose for the photo for the article he was writing. Perhaps Modesto felt that the items he had gotten from Taylor were, not, were, were his to keep. Perhaps Carl Taylor could not bring himself to ask his impoverished neighbors to return the Lent items. We do, we do know that Taylor had no qualms about issuing an occasional reprimand to Modesto by speaking harshly to him. The intricate and complex master chore boy relationship the case denotes is material of deep and complicated socio-historical significance. Too profound, unfortunately, for the makers of the exploitation film, Lash, who in their haste to turn a buck forever barred the human dimensions of this tragedy from the film, driven as they were by their need to exploit the penitentes and quote, the mari marijuana-minded Mexicans. That quote comes from, uh, I think, the Cle the, from a newspaper in Cleveland describing the, uh, the people of uh, the East Mountains here. So uh, that uh, I hope I didn't uh, over uh, overtax your patience by reading so much of the chapter, but um, 
It took a lot of work to put the chapter together, and I, I, I would rather prefer to read kind of the co condensation of ideas than to dismember it by just sort of doing a PowerPoint. So thank you. We might be able to have the, uh, the, uh, some footage from Lash to take a look at. So keep in mind that the movie is turning the material of the accusations into, into a sensationalist B, uh, B movie that also went viral, we would say today. Pretty little town, isn't it? Yes, see you. I don't like hotels. Do you think you can find me a cabin around here somewhere? Oh, see you on top of the mountain. Very nice little cabin. Is it expensive? Uh, oh, not too much. It was here when I was first here. <laughs> By the way, what's your name? Uh, my name Chico. Chico, huh? Si, you look like a pretty nice boy. Would you like to work for me? Uh, si, senor. Well, look, I'm going sighting with those people to La Morada. Go up and find the cabin, make all the arrangements, and I'll meet you right here. How's that? The altar is a very primitive one. Their hand-carved gruesome idols are set in places of honor. They reverence this figure, and to them, it has a sacred halo around its head. One can see where a little whitewash and a few lines of black paint have given the desired effect. It takes many months. It is an age-old story that their dance portrays. Man with religious tolerance and forbearance must overcome the seven deadly sins before the way of salvation will be open to him. Each floral decorated baton, representing one of the sins, vain glory or pride, avarice, gluttony, lust, sloth, envy and danger. These form the bridge of sin that man must cross unscathed. All the soul of the sinner remains forever stained and deprived of grace until he has been restored by penance. Head of La Murada, our church. But, uh, but why the whip? Soon after the dance, the flat dancers will go to the Murada and do penitence. And, uh, and do they whip themselves? Oh, well, si, si. The hermano Bullard will give them each five lashes. Think you can fix it for me to see it? Oh, no, 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 senor. It is too dangerous. I would be expelled from the Murada and maybe tell Barrio. Chico, I can pay you well. Oh, no, 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 senor. been working for this writer. He paid me good money. I did not think I could hurt our belief by showing him a la ceremonia. You know what to do. Pedro, Teofilo, siguiendo.
last it's finished. Extra for you. Extra pit! murder! You got it wrong. Pinda Pindy ran and murdered. Don't you ever read? No, I just yeah. Wait, wait, Jackie, who are the penitentiary? Penitenti, writer, murdered. Who are the penitentiaries? Have you ever heard of them? It's just a strange country, I think. You would say that. Well, I never heard of Ethiopia until Mussolini went over there. Don't you ever read? Yes. Wake up, America. Here in our own country, we can see the very heart of Africa pounding against the ribs of the Rockies. So three, three different scenes from the film. The uh, meet, uh, Mac, who is uh, Taylor, arrives in Taos and uh, meets uh, Modesto or Chico and the action gets going there, and then there's the, uh, the uh, sequence of the murder, and then the aftermath, which is a very interesting, this is a very interesting uh, conclusion to this film. Uh, one is uh, you see the uh, press churning out the, you know, acting as part of the agent of churning out the sensationalism that is both the film and the news reports. Um, and some of this language comes directly from Charles Lummis, particularly the very last line in that sequence that says, this is, we're in the heart of, uh, we're seeing the, the heart of Africa beat up against the Rockies. That's something that Charles Lummis had written in the 1890s about the Southwest. So it's all uh, kind of uh, draws out this uh, sensation. And then the gravitas of the, the, the narrator's voice, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, heavily leads us into some conclusions ahead of time about what New, Mex New Mexico villages are like. Anyway, I may be able to fill in some gaps. Um, through your questions and comments about the chapter. I think it's more uh, uh, geared to the Southwest and this idea that the Southwest still had these uh, overlays of primitive peoples that were like the African continent in some ways and operating through Charles's Lummis way of thinking about the Southwest was something called Orientalism where everything exotic and different and foreign was turned into this uh, trope of or Orientalism. Uh, which is like uh, the Middle East and Africa. And, uh, but it's very strange, even when Lama said it, it was pretty strange to figure out what did he mean, right? But I think he's referring to barbarism, things like that. I, I don't even think he was aware that the Southwest probably, a lot of the, the people originated in the Iberian Peninsula and they even put those two together. Because I think that a lot of writers uh, people that came to New Mexico, either to write or paint or whatever, they came with a preconception of a very primitive, 
people that uh, really they couldn't even pinpoint where their origins were. Uh, and even if they were indigenous people that they wrote about, the very fact that these people were able to build huge pueblos and, and, and sustain a way of life did not make them barbarians. I agree. <laughs> I, think what, I think what the film is doing is just playing up that well, thing for sensationalistic like, purposes. It's almost like that other film that DeMille did, which was uh, Birth of a Nation. You know, and this was put out there so that people really came here thinking that we were barbarians. Yeah. yeah. Well, keep in mind, Hollywood is, going to, Hollywood is going to turn a buck wherever it can, and if it's going to do it this way, it'll do it this way. And, um, and yeah. Right. Talk about the Mapachines. Oh, okay, yeah, that's another interesting, curious, the way, the, the way, way they depict them, I mean. yeah, the way that, the way the film opens is that there seems to be, there is a, a footage being taken in New Mexico, and that of the Matachines is probably from Taos. Well, and, the, the Pueblo, actually, the ruins, mm -hmm. that is a Taos Pueblo. And, the, yeah, you see the ruins of Taos Pueblo where the Battle of 1847 took place, 1848. And uh, and what's happening? That, so there's these sort of touches of authenticity that the film plays with, um, and against that is sort of this. Again, I I harken back to that deep gravitas of the narrator, who's like taking us into this mystery and foreignness and and otherness and so forth. So, um, but that that footage looks to be. Something we should ask Enrique if that if, if that could be authenticated back to the 1930s in Taos, because it's a, it's really funny f f footage, you know, with the masks and this kind of like yeah. I don't think they could possibly uh, uh, choreograph that. It seems like they're they're just uh, taking advantage of a local. Uh, uh, Matachina's performance uh, is, is my impression. Um, I don't think they would know enough about the, the topic to, to get into it that far. The mass figures of the abuelos, that's, that's very common. Um, but uh, one comment I had uh, uh, was, okay, here's Lomas, a travel writer, uh, making these, these comparisons with Africa, but then there's a supposed uh, anthropologist, Captain Bork, who worked in Texas and documented the first uh, uh, Pastores play uh, in the Rio Grande Valley down there. And then he came out to San Rafael and continued his work. But he, uh, he, was, he was very impressed with the Rio Grande Valley and, and uh, first start, was comparing it to the Nile Valley and here these civilizations, these grand uh, civilizations here. Um, and he, he became so jaded in, in, his, uh, in his work that he, he, changed the, he, he changed the description. And he said that he was wrong. It wasn't like the Nile. It was like the Congo. And so, he, so we have, a, yeah. this yeah. is the 1890s also. So yeah. it's definitely yeah. part of the, the language of that, uh, of that decade. Yeah. So. Teresa? I want to know what. What became of Modesto after he was released from prison? You know, when I was writing the book, I, I, I was calculating that he might be about uh, 86, 87 year old, something like that, 88, if he was still in the East Mountains. So I asked about for him. I asked many, many families, and no one could come up with Modesto Trujillo. Maybe I didn't ask the right people. Uh, after he's released from prison, it sort of he just goes back into the community, and we really, you know, he doesn't stand out in any way that I can see. Um, I really was hoping that he would be there because I wanted to interview him. Well, in 1936, yeah. he was 16. Yeah, he was the youngest, so, youngest uh, person to be sent up to uh, to the state prison at the time. Were you able to, to get any of the uh, uh, any of the transcripts from the? the court hearings and the sentencing yeah. and his time? Only as was reported through the newspapers, through the, mostly the Albuquerque Journal. And my thought was, you know, there are two people, there were two people uh, in the cabin when he was killed, uh, Carl Taylor and, and Modesto, right? And the moment that he's killed, it's not as you see in the, in the movie where he's typing away at the manuscript. 
the way it's reported, uh, the uh, the crime happened as uh, as uh, Taylor was getting ready for his bath, maybe in the bath, and um, and Modesto came up on him with a, a pistol that he had, someone had given him. Um, so I thought to myself, there might be some court proceedings in terms of the sentencing and all of that that, that's, that wasn't reported in the newspapers, and I'm sure that exists. But I, I thought to myself also, well, the other voice is going to be missing, you know, the eyewitness or Carl Taylor, you know. But the defense attorney would have had a motive, and they never established a motive as far as I can see. The newspapers reported that the motive was... Uh, uh, was uh, robbery. And uh, Modesto himself said, in a, this again through the newspapers, that he had uh, come down with Carl Taylor to, uh, it was before, eight, keep in mind, it's before ATM machines, right? So he comes down to Carl Taylor and he goes into the bank and withdraws some money because Taylor is going to make another one of these trips off somewhere across the globe to do some other work. And that he had, uh, you know, he had sort of decided that that was, that's the motive that Modesto gave, but we don't know what happened in the moment um, between them in the cabin during this ritual bathing that happened um, regularly. Did he have a jury trial? No jury trial. So he just went before the judge? And was sentenced. The, judge the district attorney and the set, uh, he was found guilty of murder. Um, and there was a confession. First degree murder? First degree murder. Mm -hmm. He confessed then? He confessed. He confessed that he killed Taylor. Yeah. And, he, and the motive was robbery, ostensibly. So was the lash of the penitentiary shown here in Albuquerque? And uh, how did people react to it? That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, how did you first learn about it? That's a good, I, that's a good, two good questions. Uh, first question is easier to answer <laughs> in the sense that, um, in the sense that I never discovered any, any indications that the film was screened locally and that it would have had any response from anyone. Here's, here's, a, here's something ahead of the, of the making of the film or of the, at the moment in which it's being made is uh, Governor Marby, um, no, I'm sorry, it was Clyde Tingley, Clyde Tingley was aware that this uh, film was going to be made and that it had some nudity, which we, in the, what's left of the film uh, breaks off. So we, there's some scenes that are missing, which may be the nude scenes, right? Um, another sort of titill titillating part of the film. And, um, and Tingley said uh, this was, an, uh, the, the motive was not the, the hermandad. The hermandad was not involved. It's, uh, it's pure sensationalism, and I'm going to ban the film. So that was registered in the newspapers. What the public saw, or if it ever was screened here, is a question I can't answer. Uh, I doubt that it would have been screened, because there would have been some kind of outcry from, uh, from local communities. And the second question, where did I learn about it? Yeah. I think it was when I was at the University of Utah and I used to go through these uh, film, uh, looking for material on Chicano film. And uh, I think there was a copy at UCLA that I, that I happened upon. Yeah. But obviously, it didn't, you know, the, the, only, the only place that I know of that um, sort of kept memory of this alive was down at Maisel's Trading Post down here on Central. So if you ever went into Maisel's Trading Post, they had some, some of these um, clippings from newspapers for the Carl Taylor murder case. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know um, if they had a family connection to that or what, but somebody told me about that. <laughs> and then later I went and I, I, I saw for myself that they were there, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I learned about the Carl Taylor murder story through that source, and I can't tell you who that was, but had something to do with the uh, Maisel Trading Post. Yeah. I try not to forget these things because they could turn into a chapter, right? If you pursue them enough. Yes? 
was wondering about the burning cross. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. Because that's a Scottish tradition. Yeah. The yeah. burning cross. I would have known. I wish I would have known that when I wrote the chapter. I was thinking about the uh, the uh, KKK, Clay, yeah. the KKK, and the burning of well, crosses, right? Diana Galvadon talks about that in the research she did for her novels. That it, in Scotland, before they would go to battle. They would take a burning cross around from village to village to to get the troops going to battle, and then that was brought to uh, to the new world. That's where it started. Yeah. Well, there are no there are no New Mexican equivalents no. of that no. that happening. There's just that's never been a part of New Mexican sort of expressions of of any sort. So it was sort of to <clears throat> enrage people or get people excited. It's to get their yeah their their. Is to get their, um, to get them agitated, and to um, think about these sort of these all these constructs of um, the unknown that may be threatening uh, American life, mainstream American life, and here's another instance of that, and then and then the burning cross is like a gratuitous. I don't know who came up with that. We'd have to, you know, but um, it's a real disconnect from New Mexico, and it's funny to see it here. Unfortunately, films like this is all that a lot of Easterners had as a view of the Southwest, particularly New Mexico, the northern part, where it's a little isolated up there, and they came with total, total... Uh, it's the power of popular culture going out from here with a story like this and depositing that the, the only bit of information that people would have gotten unless they're historians or in some class thinking about the history of the Southwest would have been what they would have seen through their eyes and experienced in a movie theater. So that's where the, um, it's a, it's a, there's nothing to counter that view among a general public say, you know, think of the young newspaper boys there or the, or the couple at the end, right, who are wondering, what is this story about? And all they have is what's, uh, what's in front of them. Um, and the same would have been true for, uh, for the viewing public. So those kinds of uh, impressions would have, taught, would have taught something, even at a very, at a great distance from the region that we're talking about. It would have deposited some kind of, some kind of imagery and imagination and, um, and, and we can see that that's pernicious, that can have pernicious effects. Very good, well thank you all for, for being here. <laughs>